morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Believe it or not, we're into the month of November already. It is here, and we are glad uh, that you are here with us. It's good to see your smiling faces, some of you back with us, some of you new for the first time. We're glad that you're here. We want to welcome you to North Citrus Christian Church, and want to welcome those of you that are watching online as well. As we're right here off Elkham Boulevard and Citrus Springs and right here by uh, Pine Ridge as well. So we're glad that you're uh, with us this morning. Uh, if you are visiting for the first or second time or just need to update some information, there's a little connect card that you're going to find in the pocket in front of you. If you can just fill that out uh, so that way we get a, a record of your attendance, some contact information, name, address, phone number. If you have any special prayer concerns, this is also a place you can put prayer concerns on uh, there as well. And then that can be placed on either end of the auditorium. We've got wooden boxes. You can put your connect cards or also one in the back. This is also where our regular attenders and members give their offerings. So we do not pass the plate here at North Citrus Christian Church. Uh, opportunity for you just to place your offerings in those boxes. Or you can certainly use the QR code that you're going to find in the bulletin. And scan that, it'll take you to the website, and you'll have a chance to give either a one-time gift or a recurring gift electronically and securely online. So I want to say thank you to everyone who uh, gives gifts to keep things uh, moving forward here at the church. Uh, you all are very good givers, and we uh, thank uh, for that, and thank God for the blessings of uh, uh, jobs and incomes that we can continue to keep the work moving forward. So that's always a great thing. Several things to keep in mind. Uh, we certainly want to keep Joe and his family in our prayers as they are on the road. They were, may had a trip back to West Virginia, had a wedding back there to enjoy with some friends. And so uh, they had a chance to get away uh, for the weekend. So please keep Joe and Sarah and Apollos and Lena and Eve in your prayers as they're going to be traveling back uh, this week. Because of that, there will be no Citrus Youth uh, this week only on Wednesday night. So if you have youth in that age group, uh, no meeting this week for Citrus Youth. Um, but uh, other things are, are kind of up and running as we go uh, with the trail life and the midweek uh, adults. Uh, check on the young adult because I'm, I'm sure that affects her as well uh, as far as Sarah being out for, the, for young adults. <laughs> But uh, keep in mind the different things that are happening this week. So those are all happening right here before you. So today is the monthly potluck. Now, I did notice we, we had our um, life class back in the Citrus Cafe. And obviously, we could smell everything back in the cafe at 9 o'clock mm. when we were doing our study. Now, I've noticed the smell is making its way down the hallway and it's coming into the auditoriums. I don't know what to do about that. I don't know. It just, it just kind, of, kind, of, kind of captures you as you go. So we want to say to you, even if you had not planned um, to, to, to stay or even if you didn't know for whatever reason, you are welcome to stay. Okay, I've already kind of scoped it out. There's plenty of food back there. Okay, so we're good. Thanks to everybody for pitching in. Uh, making a big difference. So we want you to come. This is kind of our pre-Thanksgiving meal. Now we say pre-Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving, folks, is two and a half weeks away. If you don't believe that, pinch yourself. If that doesn't work, reach over and pinch the person next to you. I'm sure you'll get a reaction, okay? Um, so it, it's up on us, okay? So with that said, we are also uh, starting a whole new uh, drive with a food drive. Uh, for uh, veterans. Uh, so we've got a box available over there. So now you can start bringing some non-perishable food. We're going to start doing that now in November through about December 18th. Uh, so that is all happening. So if you want to bring in non-perishable foods, we're going to work with uh, food for veterans for, for this holiday season. Of course, Trail Life, Reefs Across uh, America is coming. Anything you want to say about that or you're, you're good? Yeah, um, we spoke about that last week a little well, bit. We did. Did we? Okay. Uh, yeah, Wreaths Across America. Um, we are, as a troop, uh, collecting donations uh, for wreaths uh, to lay at the graves of veterans at the Florida National Cemetery. Uh, we're currently accepting uh, donations, $17 each per wreath, and um, the troop actually gets $5 back from that, so it is acting as a fundraiser for our troop. Um, and our real overall goal here is to really instill a sense of um, reverence and, um, and honor toward those who have sacrificed for our country, uh, to instill that in our boys. Um, and uh, on December 16th, they'll actually be laying the wreaths at the cemetery uh, as a troop. 
and um, you were just uh, really honored to be part of that great organization. And um, yeah, uh, if you have any questions, uh, come talk to me. Cool. So that's Scott with Trail Life, and uh, it's an extension ministry of our church, and we're excited to uh, raise uh, young men and, and boys in, in a Christian environment and uh, all the work that they're involved in service projects. So that's great. Uh, keep in mind other opportunities there as well with upcoming studies into the new year uh, and different things that are happening. So let's, uh, let's be standing. Uh, let's stand together. And we're going to have our opening prayer, and then we're going to go right into uh, our worship time together. Father God, what a privilege it is to simply open our mouths, open our hearts, and to know that you are there to hear us. Lord, sometimes there's a lot of things on our heart. Sometimes there's a lot of hurt. Sometimes there's a lot of emotional, spiritual pain. Sometimes there's praise and thanksgiving. And sometimes there's difficult times, but also celebrations. Father, help us now as we just lay all that before you and as we just worship you with all of our heart. As this season of Thanksgiving, we just lay before you and we say thank you, first of all, for who you are. You are God. Thank you for uh, what you have done for us. Lord, help us as we uh, confess our, our sins before you and then as we lean upon you for support and guidance in everything we say and everything we do. Lord, again, be with those who are unable to be with us today and bring them back with us safely. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Excited to see us all gathered here this morning that we get to worship God together. We're going to start with the song, We Will Glorify. So sing along with us. Glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the We will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to Of your love will always be enough. 
will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing
dying to know who you are. You've shown us the way to your heart. So Father, I pray, make me more like Jesus. More like Jesus, I pray, make me more like Jesus. seated. Good morning, folks. You know, a few times ago when I did this, um, I, I need reading glasses after I had my cataract surgery and I forgot my glasses and it was kind of lucky that the day I decided to write my my notes in a little larger fonts so I was holding the paper out here so I could try to figure it out but uh, so I've gotten used to doing that just in case I forget my glasses I'd like to talk to you a little bit about signposts that we see in our lives. Kind of like as we drive, we often see road signs posted along the way. Uh, these serve as indicators to us. They help us to understand when there's a dangerous curve ahead. They help us to understand that speed detected by radar means you may get a ticket. Or even children at play. They serve to remind us to drive safely and to obey the traffic laws. Without such a roadside reminder, it would be easy for us to lose our way, have an accident, or even lose our lives, and worse yet, take someone else's. Not to mention the dignity and cost of receiving a traffic ticket. And I'm sure that most of us have received at least one <laughs> the Lord's Supper is also an indicator or sign that helps us navigate the road of life. All the important reminders are there. At the Lord's table, we see God's justice demanding that all transactions, all transactions be paid for. But we also come to face with the one who served our sentence for us. We didn't, he did. As we gather, we of course recall the words of Jesus, do this in remembrance of me. Words that recall his love and sacrifice. <clears throat> but there are also other areas of living that Christ wants us to remember in this communion time. Jesus told a parable about the mercy and forgiveness in the parable of the unmerciful servant. In verse 1833, Jesus said, shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? As you recall, okay, the ruler forgave one of his servants a large amount that he owed. Just said, you don't owe it anymore. 
And this servant went out there and went to people that owed him money and didn't do that. Okay, he showed no mercy. The man in Jesus' parable was shown unlimited mercy as his tremendous debt was canceled. Yet this forgiven man refused to extend any forgiveness to his debtor. The master reminds us that an unmerciful heart costs more than we'll ever know. Since we have received his unlimited mercy, how can we not extend the same mercy to others? Sometimes I ask myself that question. This communion time reminds us of our abundant blessing of grace, but also emphasizes our divine obligation to forgive our debtors, as the Bible says, 70 times 7, if necessary. The other area is love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are told in 1 John 4.11 that since we have been loved by the Father, we also ought to love one another. This is not brotherly love or love born of fashion, uh, excuse me, passion. It's agape love that must seek the absolute best for others at any cost. This was the magnitude of the love extended to us on the cross when Jesus died for us. And the kind of love the master expects us to show for our fellow man. The road Jesus walked was clearly marked by signs indicating the danger just ahead. But he knowingly ignored these signs and suffered at the hands of those who refused to show mercy and love. Let the, Lord, let, the Lord's prayer, let the Lord's Supper be a sign for us, a reminder to live a life filled with mercy and love. When we reflect on what Jesus did, how can we do otherwise? Gentlemen, will you please stand? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to show love to our, our brothers and sisters, as Jesus showed us in the love he had for us. Help us to learn mercy to others, just like Jesus did for us. Amen.
Good morning, folks. We want to welcome you uh, today, uh, the continuing study in the book of Acts. Uh, we have actually have this week and next week when Joe comes back. Uh, he will uh, finish up uh, the study of the book of Acts before we jump into the season of Thanksgiving. Now, I have to admit that Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. It just, it just is. And I, I was deeply distressed from Facebook posts this week that says, Halloween's over, now it's Merry Christmas. Oh, I love Christmas, but let's don't forget about Thanksgiving, folks. Um, it's so important, not just for this season of Thanksgiving, but uh, to be thankful year-round uh, for everybody. Um, and as I look out and I see faces, I am so thankful for each and every one of you. Um, it just uh, You enrich our, our lives just by doing life together. And uh, that, that's a wonderful thing. I've been doing a little Thanksgiving challenge on, on Facebook, and uh, we're up to, to today's, and I've yet to do it, but I think I came up with the answer. The question is, what family member are you most thankful for? And I'm thinking, oh, great. They really want to divide our families, don't they? Um, you sit there and pick one over the other. You know, as we were growing up, our kids would always ask us, you know, am I your favorite? Am I your favorite? Am I your favorite? And we, we had a pat answer that worked for, for both Sarah and Nathan. And the answer was, there's enough love to go around for everyone. There's enough love to go around for everyone. So when I think about family members, I can't choose one. Now, of course, I would choose my wife, Kim. But then, you know, then there's our daughter, Sarah, and then our Nathan. Then there's our, our extended family and friends and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and this, that. And but then I thought about it and I said, you know, what family member are you most... What about the family of God? What about the family of God? Why do we have to define it just by blood relatives or who we choose to marry or who we choose to spend life with? The family of God is, is who, and the good thing about the family of God is my family's included in the family of God. So I don't have to exclude them in any way. I can just include them and then just make the circle bigger for everybody else. So I am thankful today for you, okay? Um, as a family of God, you are encouraging to us, uh, walk in on a given Sunday morning and there's just all kinds of activity going on, everybody doing this, prepping for that, and here comes the food, you know, it's just like everything coming together, we're going to enjoy a potluck together. Uh, it's great to see you on any given Sunday and throughout the week, and I uh, just want to say thank you uh, to each and every one of you. Let's pray. Father God, help us this morning as we dig into your word, find us faithful to uh, dig into the life of Paul and some of the things that he dealt with between uh, with rulers and kings and his life that was on the line uh, as he was being sentenced for crimes that he didn't commit. Father, I just pray that you just help us to find our story in his. And may we be encouraged and may we be thankful for the life that you have given us to make the most of the life that you have given us and how we live before you a holy God. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to be working our way through uh, Acts chapter 25 and 26 today. So if you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to turn there. If not, you can grab one in the uh, pocket in front of you or find it on your phone. Stay with digital Bibles that are there as well. Uh, this is Paul. Uh, in his witness before kings and rulers. Again, his missionary journeys took him from place to place, not necessarily because he planned it, but he was running from people who were following him, trying to take his life. As a matter of fact, as we uh, enter into Acts chapter 25, uh, you got your sermon notes there too, so pull those out and take notes and fill in the blanks as we go. Um, we see him as a witness before Festus. Festus was the the... the um, the, the governor of the day, he's there, uh, and so he is uh, taking a look at, at different things that are happening, and uh, he's trying to make a decision. Remember, he had kind of got uh, this case passed on to him from, from another, and now he's looking to try to figure out what to, to do. In fact, Festus is kind of searching this out, so he actually goes to uh, Jerusalem uh, to talk with chief uh, priests and Jewish leaders, because they were wanting to take his life. And so they were wanting him to move the trial from Caesarea to Jerusalem for one purpose. So that they might ambush him on the way to Jerusalem and take his life and kill him. Well, Festus was uh, wise to that and uh, realized that that was not going to take place. So uh, he decided that that was going to stay in Caesarea 
and that those accusations could come against him at that point and then go from there. And so they start talking, and uh, verse 5, we kind of look at this. It says, we found this man, um, I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 25, uh, after spending, uh, verse 6, after spending eight or ten days with them, he went down to Caesarea. Next day he convened the court, ordered Paul be brought before him. And when he was brought before him, they stood around, they brought many serious charges against him, which they could not prove. Folks, we live in a culture today that there are all kinds of things said about all kinds of people and things, and, and you don't know what to believe, right and left. And In fact, I'm kind of watching what's happening with this AI and what's happening with, you, you can't even believe what you see anymore whether it's on the internet or whether it's on TV or what you read, whether it's, it's truth or whether it's not truth or something just contrived, it, it's really kind of scary. I can tell you, you can believe what you read in God's Word. I can tell you that. And I can tell you that as we move forward from here, it's going to get a little trickier because people are going to gather around, people are going to talk it out, and they're going to gather people around them to hear what they want to hear and to say what they want to say and, and to believe what they want to believe. And the fact of the matter is the more we talk it out and the more we gather others around us, the more we believe the lie. Isn't it amazing when you start looking at people and you just they, they start talking about themselves and then all of a sudden somebody goes, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's right. Yeah, that. And you're like, no, it's not. <laughs> no, no, it's not. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what, but, but everybody, but, well, you know, that's what culture says. That, that's what, you know, we believe as culture. And all of a sudden we is it kind of grown and, it, and it's like yeast to bread. It's just kind of blown out of proportion. The more we talk it out, the more we gather around others, the more we believe the lie. And they believed that literally they had charges against Paul. But no, those charges were nothing to hold a stick to. I want to reference 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. Hold your spot there in the book of Acts, but if you want to turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I want to share with you these words of encouragement that Paul writes to a young Timothy. And it's very insightful, and I'm actually going to have you read these with me off the screen. 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting with verse 3. Read this with me, if you will. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Thank you for doing that. Folks, I think we've come into that time. When men gather uh, people around them, in, uh, instead of putting up with sound doctrine, well, this is what the Bible says, but I don't care what the Bible says, they say. You know, this is what I want, or I want to justify my behavior. And so I've kind of gathered people around me that agree with me. And, and I, I, they, what they say, I, I agree with. And so I'm kind of turned away from the truth and turned towards myths. Paul says, keep your head in all situations. Endure the hardship. You see, Paul had done nothing wrong he had done nothing wrong in verse 8 of Acts chapter 25 against the law of the Jews. He had done nothing wrong against the temple. He had done nothing wrong against Caesar. But yet he found himself in this corrupt um, situation before rulers and kings. And here is Festus. Festus, who was wishing to do the Jews a favor. Now, folks, you always get yourselves in trouble when you're wishing to do someone a favor. <laughs> and it's not uh, just. It's not fair to all involved. Be careful when you run into those situations. Uh, he even uh, wanted to do them a favor, so they were wanting to move the case to Jerusalem. So he asked Paul. He said, Paul, do you, you want to go up to Jerusalem? I, I love Paul's uh, answer here. He says, uh, I'm now standing before Caesar's court. Verse 10. I, I'm here now. <laughs> Try me. Uh, but yet Festus would not take that step. Paul's cry was simple in verse 10 and following. He says, 
I have not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. Verse 11, if, however, if I am guilty of anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, then no one has a right to hand me over to them. Paul's cry was, let justice be served. Let justice be served. Folks, can we hope for anything better than that? For divine justice to be served? For what is the truth to finally be revealed? And for uh, the sheep to be separated from the goats? And and for the righteous to go to eternal heaven? And for the wicked to go to eternal punishment? That's the way God set it up. That's God's system. That's justice. Now, we're not always going to uh, understand that this side of heaven. But it's coming. It's coming. And thank God for it. And Paul was in the middle of this because he was just being tossed back and forth. And his very life was on the line as to how people were going to make this decision about his life. And as a Roman citizen, he made an appeal. He says, I appeal to Caesar. Now that was going to move him eventually from Caesarea to Rome. Now, that wasn't necessarily a good thing because that was a higher court. And there'd be a chance that he'd have a a greater punishment come down upon him. But, as we will see later, this was all in God's plan. So Festus was kind of back and forth. And he's like, okay, all right, you appeal to Caesar. Okay, let me consult my friend. So Festus brings in his friend by the name of King Agrippa. King Agrippa. Uh, King Agrippa. Uh, comes with his uh, sister, Bernice, okay? Um, I'm not sure where they come up with these names. You, you ever wonder that? You know, Festus, you know, King Agrippa, Bernice. I, I was looking at those, and I looked at it, and I, I was realizing, I, I was like, man, those are really kind of funny. And I went back to my genealogy, and I realized that my grandma Beard's middle name was Bernice. It's like, I better be careful with that. Okay, but there it is. Uh, who comes up with these names anyway? Um, old stories told about a lady um, who had actually was having some health problems as she was pregnant uh, with her, her, her child, and she had uh, given birth. And at the time, she didn't realize it, but she actually gave birth to twins. But the pregnancy was very difficult that they had to kind of keep her medicated uh, after the birth of her twins, and so she didn't see him. The husband wasn't in the picture, um, and the only person who was in the picture was her brother. And so after she woke up, uh, the nurse came and says, well, I have uh, some good news for you and uh, uh, maybe some not so good news. And she goes, well, what's the good news? She goes, the good news is you had twins. Oh, she goes, oh, that's wonderful. I had twins. I had no idea. What's, what's the not so good news? Well, your brother was the only one here and we had to name the twins. And so we had your brother name your twin. No, no. No, not my brother. No, you don't understand my... No, anybody but my brother. He can't name my kids. She goes, well, you know, we had to have the paperwork in line, and we didn't know how long it was going to take for you to... Said, oh, great. All right. Well, first of all, what I have... She goes, well, you had a girl, and you had a boy. Oh, that's wonderful. I have one of each, a girl and a boy. All right. Give it to me. What do you name the girl? Well, he named the girl... Denise. Denise. Wow. I actually like that name. That's a good name. I I, I like that. I think that's great. Okay, well, what do you name the boy? Well, he named the boy (laughs) Denephew. Thought you might enjoy that this morning. So here's Festus and Agrippa and Bernice. Now Agrippa, interesting enough, was a Herod Agrippa. So he was of the line and descent of Herod the Great that was there at the birth of Christ. Uh, he was a part of that system. Um, and so he was actually the great-grandson of, of Herod uh, the Great. And as he went forward, he uh, takes in some of the knowledge that is being shared. Uh, Festus is sharing that with him in verses 13 through 22. Uh, some of the things that are happening, and he too wants to hear uh, Paul. And so he's going to have his opportunity to hear Paul as he comes before Agrippa. So Paul is presented uh, to King Agrippa here, 
And uh, the next day, uh, pomp and circumstance, the court is kind of following. Now, they had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, circumstance, uh, royal robes and flowing in and crowds that would gather. It was like a circus, okay? And it was quickly uh, becoming a circus, uh, a show for many others to be entertained. But here's the thing that God did. God used this to get the message out to more people. So even in the midst of difficult times, even in the midst of Paul being tried, uh, more people were hearing about it, more people were gathering around because now Herod Agrippa was involved and he had brought his sister with him who was actually his mis- mis- mistress as well. I'm not going to get into all those details. But as we go into it, uh, people started gathering around and then he gave Paul an opportunity to present before him. You see, sometimes when we experience problems in life, we may just shake our head and we don't understand, how did I get myself in in here? Everybody's hearing about this and everybody's this, that, and the other. Your problems may be God's opportunities in disguise. Here they came. Here the message was getting out to more people. Paul's name was being slurred through the mud. His exposure was growing, large crowds were gathering, but there were also more influential, more famous people that got involved and more people who would hear the word of God proclaimed. And folks, it was all God's plan from the beginning. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying to you, when you encounter problems in your life, when you encounter challenges that come your way, that's not what you expected. Maybe uh, you're dealing with health issues and all of a sudden you find yourself in the healthcare system and you're meeting new people and nurses and doctors and coming and going. Or, or you move to a different area and you're trying to find your t- a new home and make transitions or this or that or the other thing. God is expanding your world of influence. Realize that even in the midst of problems, there are great opportunities that God is using to talk with doctors and to let them know that, yes, we are praying for this person and we, we're going to believe and we're going to follow this path and we're going to believe the best and, and how this works out. And, and that doctor may not be a Christian. That, that neighbor may not be a Christian. God may move you right next door to somebody that you never would have moved next door to. But lo and behold, you are there to make an influence in their lives. And folks, please realize that some of those problems that we have in our life, it's not up to us just to sit back and go, woe is me. (laughs) Oh, that's so horrible. No, realize that God is using those for his opportunity to spread the gospel. So the story moves on as we move into Acts chapter 26, and we take a look at Paul's witness before King Agrippa. Uh, He actually turns to Paul and gives him uh, exactly what Paul was looking for, um, a chance to to speak for himself and a chance to openly uh, share his faith. Uh, Paul's given this opportunity, and so he motioned with his hand. He began his defense, uh, talked about some of his uh, uh, upbringing, how he was brought up in in Jewish household, uh, how he had great respect, how he had lived as a Pharisee, how he had hope in what God had promised, and then talking about how, how Jesus now is fulfilled and how he is holding on to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. And he says, and that's why I'm on trial here today. And then he goes on into verse 8 and says, Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? Is there anything in your life that God cannot change? Is there anything in your life that God cannot do? I remember a little boy once said, oh, if God can do anything, he wants to do any time, any place, anywhere, and he, he's all powerful, and he's all this, and he's all that. Can God make a rock so big that even he can't move it? 
Yes, of course, he could. God can do anything he wants to do anytime, any place, anywhere, and with anyone. Okay? He doesn't need our permission. And if he wants to raise his son, Jesus Christ, from the dead, then he can do it. He doesn't need men to believe it. He just needs the message to be proclaimed. And folks, I don't know where you are at your situation in life, but God is still working in your life. God is still working where you are. And you may be in a spot where you're just wondering, how am I going to get out of this? How did I get myself in this financial hole? How did I get myself here? How did we get into this health situation? How, how, how my family, it's falling apart. I don't even know if we're going to see each other for the holidays. We don't want to talk to each other, let alone be in the same room. What are we going to do? God can and God will make a difference. Hold on to God. And folks, as you hold on to God, be faithful to his word. As Paul did, he presented the gospel without apology. He seized the opportunity that was directly in front of him. Verses 9 through 23 from Acts chapter 26, we read these words. Paul, I too was convinced that I also ought to do all that was possible to expose, to oppose rather, the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. And on one of these journeys, verse 12, as I was going to Damascus, with the authority and the commission of the chief priest, about noon, O king, I was on the road, and I saw a light from heaven. It was brighter than the sun. It was blazing around me and my companions, and we all fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. Then I asked, well, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness to what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. And I am sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to God. So that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea and the Gentiles also. I preached that they should repent, turn to God, and prove their repentance by their deeds. And that is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help to this very day. And so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer and be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. What a message. What an opportunity. He had a chance to share that before everybody who had gathered. And people who had never heard the message before heard it came from Paul and his own experience. They knew that he was a persecutor of the church. They knew he had dragged Christians out and had them arrested and had them killed. But now his life had been transformed. He had, on the road to Damascus, he was blinded by the light. And then God sent a a man by the name of Ananias to come. And and he uh, healed him of his blindness. And he baptized him into Christ. and, And then he led his life forward from that point Better than anybody else perhaps have lived life recorded in Scripture other than Jesus Christ himself. You need sometimes, folks, God has to get our attention because we're our own worst enemy. You know, here it says in in, in, uh, verse 14, he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Um, actually, an ox goad was a sharp stick used to prod cattle. And the point here is that he, he was being prodded by God, but he, he wasn't listening to God. He was his own worst enemy. And when we're our own worst enemy, we're only hurting ourselves. 
We're only hurting ourselves. Because God wants us to do something, but we don't want to do it. Or we, don't, we, we just want to do something else. Or our bodies, oh, I'm too tired. Or I'm, you know, we need just to make it happen. We need just to turn our lives around and say, okay, this is the direction I go. And you know, I know this is true. I know this is going to work itself out in time. I know this is what it looks like. And I need to live my life on purpose for God. Folks, beware of being our own worst enemy and only hurting ourselves. I love what is said in verse 20 here of Acts chapter 26. Um, You know, it's funny how you can read the scripture over and over again and not see something until it just jumps out at you one day. Well, as I was preparing for this message, this jumped out at me. This is the best view of repentance that I've ever seen. And it's very simple, but it points it out. Now, repentance is a word that we don't like to hear, but this is what Paul preached. He preached, first of all, you need to repent. That means you need to turn from your sins. Okay? You know, we hear a lot about believe, just believe, and just claim, claim this, and claim that, and you live the way you want to live, but just as long as you believe, you're good to go. That's not what this Bible says. The Bible says believe, yes, but then it says you must repent, folks. You need to turn from your sins. Second of all, he doesn't stop there. Once you've turned from your sins, you've got to turn to something. You've got to turn to God. Now, Interesting enough, we uh, play a lot of music around, and I've got a lot of music lovers in our family and stuff. Uh, Every once in a while, you get one of those songs in your head. You know what I'm talking about, and you start singing it. I I did it back uh, when I was in high school. I remember my brother used to take me to uh, uh, drop me off at high school, and he'd play the the country music station. And I'd be walking into high school singing, two doors down, they're laughing and drinking and having nothing. It's like, what? What am I singing? Where did that come from? Well, I listened to it in the car before I got there. And the fact of the matter is, I had to get that out of my mind. The only way to get that out of your mind is to replace it with something else. Otherwise, it keeps replaying over and over and over again. Folks, when it comes to repentance, we can repent from our sin, turn from our sin, but we've got to replace that by turning to God. We've got to replace that with new habits and, and Bible reading and prayer and, and coming to church and, and being together. And then he goes on to say you need to prove your repentance. And I, this is really not found a whole lot of other places in Scripture uh, with these three together in one spot. But he just puts it all together. Prove your repentance by your deeds. He does talk about good works and how that's so important. Okay, Faith without works is dead. But prove your repentance by your deeds. Very insightful. So when you think about what God's calling you to do, it's not just about saying, oh yeah, okay, well, I'm living for God now. Well, no, it, he wants you to turn from your sin. If you, There's things that you know that you're doing wrong that are not pleasing to God. You need to address those areas. And you need to turn to God and understand what God wants you to do. And then you need to continue to be faithful to him through your works and your deeds as you move forward. All right, so some of you have wondered about this Festus guy. Who is this guy anyway? Anybody of you recognize that guy on the screen? Festus, deputy on gun smoke, okay? This is not the same Festus that we're talking about here. But you know what? It was the best picture I could come up with for Festus being festered. Because Festus in this situation is festered by what Paul had to say. He was not happy with what Paul had to say. In fact, he interrupted Paul. It wasn't Festus on gun smoke, but it was Festus that was dealing with Paul. He interrupted him and says, you're out of your mind. You're going crazy. Your learning is driving you insane. Folks, I don't know about you, but if somebody said that to me, I think I'd be a little festered on my end as well. How would you respond to something like that if somebody just looks you straight in the eye and says you're going out of your mind or some authority figure says you're 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 insane. What you have to say, you're just crazy. They look at you like you have two heads. Boy, Paul had an amazing response. He was risking his life for a message that was offensive to the Jews and unbelievable to the Gentiles. And yet, Paul's response is incredible. He could have responded in hatred. 
He could have responded in frustration. He could have responded just, oh, just come back straight up. I'm not crazy. How dare you say I'm not? No, but he, he did say very calmly, matter of factly, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, verse 25. What I'm saying to you is true and reasonable. And then he went on to speak of King Agrippa and the things that uh, they had common belief in and gave Agrippa a chance to make a decision as well. Folks, this is so important to take a look at from Proverbs 15, verse 1. It says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. How many of you have ever been guilty of some harsh words through the years? How many of you realize that some of the harshest words you say are usually to the ones that you love the most? <laughs> we feel a little bit more comfortable and we just kind of feel like we can say anything and any time, any place, and sometimes we just lay it out there. <laughs> or sometimes we don't care who we say it to or who hears it. We just kind of lay it out there. The Bible says that it's a gentle answer that turns away wrath. Now again, I wasn't there in the courtroom. I don't know exactly how Paul said this, but... Again, I, I kind of get the feeling he said this matter of factly. He wasn't coming up against Festus face to face. Well, I'm not insane. He didn't say it that way. No, look at the respect he gives him. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. And then he calmly goes on to say what he is saying is true and reasonable. As a matter of fact, here the king Agrippa is familiar with these things. I can speak freely to him. This hasn't escaped his notice. And then he addresses uh, uh, Agrippa as well. Uh, furthermore, in Proverbs 15, we read verse 2. It says, The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. You ever hear the expression, better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt? Better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Notice Paul here. This circus, uh, this gathering, this crowd, the, all these people around, he wasn't intimidated uh, by any of them. He simply uh, kept his focus and shared his faith. Folks, don't be intimidated if somebody comes across as strong or somebody's got a doctorate after their name or somebody's got this all figured out and they're sharing with you all this great uh, phenomenal philosophy or message. No, just share with them the simple message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be intimidated by your bosses at work or, or your supervisors or other co-workers or even be intimidated by the culture or the, the news media or, or celebrities uh, in and of this culture. They're just people like you and me and they need a savior like you and me. And Paul understood that. So much so that he approached King Agrippa and he simply asked him, King Agrippa, verse 27, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. And Agrippa was on the edge. He was right there. But Agrippa said to Paul, do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. King Agrippa stopped within hearing distance of the kingdom of God. He had too much at stake. He was more concerned about his own kingdom than he was about God's kingdom. Folks, what does your own kingdom look like? Are there things in your life right now that you're more concerned about your own kingdom than you are about God's kingdom for all eternity? If so, we need to uh, address those issues. And furthermore, look at your circle of influence. Think about who God has put into your path. You might be surprised who's in that number where you work, uh, your neighbors, uh, here, there, everywhere you go, maybe you go to the same restaurants, you go to the same grocery stores, you, you go here, you see the same people, you interact with them. God has put those people into your path for a reason. They're not there by mistake. 
He wants you to represent him. He wants you to calmly go about giving a gentle answer. He wants you to calmly go about sharing your faith. You say, oh, but that, that you, know, you don't know how hard that is. Well, you know, folks, when I think about hard, I think about some of the missionaries that take the gospel across to uh, different parts of the world and actually give their lives for the gospel. Jim Elliott was one of those. And he said this before he died. He is no fool to give what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose. I've heard some of you say that I have to have some very difficult prayers for my loved ones. I pray that God will do anything in their life to get their attention. That's tough love, and that's a difficult prayer. But again, you're no fool to give what you cannot keep, to gain what you cannot lose. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 38, there's a section of it that simply says, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Folks, there's going to be a time of our lives where we're going to look back, and this time that we spend here on this earth is going to seem like a little dot in time. Harry, you were sharing in uh, Sunday school this morning how 80 plus years have just flown by. Just here. Gone. Folks, when we look at the scope of eternity compared to what we experience in this little dot on the number line of eternity, it's very insignificant. But yet the decisions that we make are very significant. Please know, as my dad has always told me, there are no guarantees in this life, only in the life to come. So folks, if you're going to put your eggs in one basket, hopefully it's the basket that's going to be for all eternity through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I don't know what you're dealing with in your life right now. I know you've got a lot of stresses on your life heading into the holidays, this, that, and the other. But I can tell you that God directs the circumstances of our lives to accomplish His will. You see, Paul appealed to Caesar... And so eventually the decision that was made and Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. But to Caesar he must go. Do you know where that sent him? That sent him to Rome. Do you know where many of his uh, prison epistles and letters were written from? Rome. Do you know a whole world that he was able to touch and where he touched them from? Rome. Rome. It was another whole part of the world that the message got out he, in dealing with the uh, Greco-Roman culture. And it's because God directed the circumstances of his life to make a difference, to spread the gospel. Maybe God is directing the circumstances of your life right now. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how God's going to get your attention. God brought Paul face to face with Jesus on that road to Damascus. And he looked up and he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. You're your own worst enemy. Get your senses in order. And, and he prayed and he sought and he found Jesus in a personal relationship with him on his road to Damascus experience. Folks, it's our time. The time is now for us to turn our eyes upon Jesus. Um. Murray, if you could go ahead and get the Citrus Kids from the back, have them come forward. I want you to think this morning as the worship team comes forward. I want you to think about what God is calling in your life. Now, I'm not, I'm not here to say that your life's going to be all rosy. Um, it's all going to be sunshine and no, no thorns, no clouds. It's going to be easy. No, I'm not, I'm not here to tell you that. In fact, as I look out over here, I know some of you are going through some very difficult times or have come through some difficult times or getting ready to head into difficult times. But I can tell you that your answer is going to come by turning your eyes upon Jesus. No matter what you're dealing with in this life, no matter what uh, struggles, no matter what addictions, no matter what is coming your way, um, Jesus is the answer to that. And we thank God for that. Come on down, folks as we all stand together, and uh, we're going to sing together uh, our invitation hymn. And if you have a decision uh, to make uh, today, 
We want to encourage you to come, perhaps to give your life to Christ for the first time, perhaps to uh, repent of your sins, turn from your sin, turn to God, and then to follow through uh, with God calls us to do, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, immersed uh, for forgiveness of sins, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then to live a faithful life. If you're here, uh, you've already made those decisions, and you want to give your uh, membership to the church and just say, hey, I want to be a part here, you can certainly do that as well. Let's stand as we sing. Um, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. I want you to continue standing with this young man, uh, this young man who is 10 years old. Preston uh, Reeves comes and says, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ, and I want to... Okay. And as he took that step into the aisle and just kind of like, okay, I've never done this before. <laughs> How are you feeling? Nervous. Nervous. Good. Good. I want you to be nervous. Because this is the most important decision of your life. But the good news is you got it right. Okay? And so mom's back there taking pictures and uh, smiling real big. Um, and uh, sister's up here too, giving your encouragement and family and friends. And uh, I told them that these people are your friends. Okay? This is the family of God and they're here to support you. Uh, Preston's going to be baptized into Christ this morning. Um, so I'm going to take uh, your uh, affirmation of your faith. So I'm just going to ask you just to repeat after me, if you would, please. I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. And I accept him. And I accept him. As my Lord. As my Lord. And Savior. And Savior. Amen. Amen. All right, you may go ahead and take a seat as we get ready, and then we'll be having a baptism together. And I can see 
Water's raging at my feet I can feel the breath of those surrounding me I can hear the sound of nations rising up We will not be overtaken We will not be overcome I can walk down this dark and painful road I can face every fear of the unknown I can hear all God's children Jesus from the grave The same power that commands the dead to wake Lives in us Lives in us The same power that moves mountains when He speaks The same power that can calm a raging sea Lives in us Lives in us That his promises are true in his strength there is nothing we can do yes we know there are greater things in store we will not be overtaken we will not be overcome the same power that rose jesus from the grave the same power that commands the dead to wait lives in to him and saying, I want you to use my life for all eternity and the purpose of living for you as a Christian. You're dying to the old Preston and you're coming to life in Jesus Christ. And baptism is symbolic of the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And so now, Preston, you're now being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Belong to Jesus. 
Jesus, Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. We're going to go ahead and uh, stand and have our closing prayer. And then we'll have our closing chorus as we go from there. Father God, just we want to give you thanks, first and foremost, for growing your church, for working in the hearts and minds of young men and young women and, and, and the lives of adults, and Lord, just drawing people back to you. Father, that's first and foremost, and we just want to say thank you. Uh, we do want to say thank you uh, for our time together, uh, fellowship, and for the meal in front of us, and just pray for... Uh, nourishment of our food, and uh, thank you for those that have uh, pitched in to be a part of that as well. Lord, help us as we start this new week, and as we are faithful in taking the gospel to a world that is in need of a Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh 